Welcome to the fourth installment of the Global, Mal Global Malaysia series brought to you by the Economic Transformation Programme. Um, uh, the Global Malaysia series is intended to sort of get us as Malaysian corporates, Malaysian businesses uh, and Malaysian individuals to kind of like look outwards um, into sort of how to expand um, into the regional as well as the global arena. Um, and today we have the, the uh, fantastic uh, pleasure of having Dr. Sri Nazir Razak here with us. Um, he needs no introduction, uh, other than the fact that he's leading one of the um, major investment banks in the region, uh, the CIMB Group, and uh, as, group, as managing, direct, group managing director of, of the organization. Welcome. Welcome, Nazir. Um, just, um, just to outline the proceedings, I think we'll spend the first, 45, um, first, um, sorry, first half an hour um, um, for me asking questions of Datuk Na Nazir. Um, and then after that, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be accompanied by uh, Datuk Sri Idris Jala, uh, who will also have some uh, input into this, especially after the recent budget. And then after that, um, for about half an hour, where we have a three-way conversation, and then we'll have another, have another half an hour for, the, um, for, for questions uh, off the floor. So that's the uh, proceedings of the day. Um, with that short introduction, just wanted to ask you, CIMB Group has positioned itself as um, an ASEAN player. Um, when did the genesis of ASEAN uh, enter your consciousness? The history is that in the mid-2000s, which was 2005, um, we went on this transformation of uh, CIMB uh, from a Malaysian investment bank uh, to a universal bank. Uh, some of you will recall CIMB then bought Bumbutra Commerce, bought Southern Bank here uh, in Malaysia, uh, and then and, and of course also GK Go in Singapore, right? Those were the, the early pieces uh, to essentially transform CIMB from uh, um, uh, investment bank to universal bank. Um, and around 2007, um, <clears throat> this whole ASEAN charter came up uh, and we kind of looked at it and said that, look, we are evolving uh, from a Malaysian uh, investment bank uh, to a Malaysian universal bank and starting uh, to then say that we could do this across the region. Uh, and when ASEAN embraced this whole notion of AEC, ASEAN Economic Integration by 2015, uh, we noticed how uh, that's very much aligned with what we were uh, trying to achieve as a business. Uh, so then we embraced it. Uh, we aligned our business model uh, to ASEAN uh, and that had various uh, stages, uh, but uh, uh, most recently we actually took ASEAN and put it in our tagline, uh, ASEAN uh, for you. Uh, so that's, that's how, uh, uh, that's the timeline, uh, if you like. So 2004, 2005 um, sort of time frame. And when, was it, um, so once you've um, developed that, um, um, that, the fact that you are trying to um, uh, go with the ASEAN uh, strategy, how was it in terms of looking at opportunities across the, re across the ASEAN region, um, did you actively go out and seek seek deals or seek um, companies to acquire? Or was it kind of landed in your lap, um, you know, through just, you know, just normal deal flow that, that happens? Once we had said that we wanted to be the ASEAN bank, uh, we put this whole agenda into our internal vision statement uh, to be uh, the premier um, universal bank in ASEAN. Uh, once we did that, uh, it's automatic that we then want to have a strategy uh, and ultimately a presence for every market in ASEAN. Uh, the first, uh, if you look at the, the, the sort of mid-2000s, um, we then took on, by buying Bumbutra Commerce, we also uh, took Bang Niaga uh, in Indonesia. Uh, when we bought GK Go, uh, we had stockbroking uh, operations in, in most of the major markets uh, in ASEAN. Uh, then it's about scouting for uh, more opportunities. Uh, and the way we did it was we looked at every market, uh, uh, opportunities and strategies. So uh, we've decided that in more developed markets like uh, Thailand, uh, Philippines, uh, we would have to buy. Uh, and Singapore, we would have liked to buy, uh, but uh, we couldn't find anything at a decent price. Uh, then we decided that the, mark, the less developed markets, uh, we should take a different strategy because um, the financial markets, they're so underdeveloped that you can actually ramp up very quickly. 
So like in Cambodia, uh, we applied and got a new banking license, and we're trying to do the same in Vietnam. Yeah. So that's different strategies for different markets. Mature markets buy, acquire, um, green, um, less mature markets, greenfield, yeah. greenfield operations. So just to ask, um, then, then the RBS opportunity came up. RBS wanted to sell its, um, its assets in Asia. Um, now you have an ASEAN strategy, but then you also have, um, with RBS, you also have, uh, op, you know, sort of assets in North Asia, Korea, and even sort of um, um, uh, India, uh, I believe um, Taiwan as well. Um, how does that fit into your ASEAN strategy? We have not altered that strategy. We want to be the premier universal bank in ASEAN. But in order to achieve that, we believe that we need to have um, presence and operations in key markets that uh, interface with ASEAN, uh, that trade with ASEAN, that invest in and out of ASEAN. Um, so if you take um, the RBS platform, it gave us uh, uh, new operations, investment banking operations in Australia, uh, uh, Taiwan, Korea, China, India, uh, and also strengthen our presence in London and New York. Uh, and what it meant is that we actually have the uh, on-ground investment banking people and capabilities uh, to help uh, investors who want to come into ASEAN and to help ASEAN clients who want to go into those countries. Yeah, so the problem is, like, uh, 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 and you know, it's quite coincidental uh, that the day I opened the Sydney office, our new Sydney operations, was the same day that the Australian government actually issued their white paper on the Asian century. Yeah, that, that this century is about Asia and basically Australians have to be Asian. Uh, so then it perked a lot of interest. A lot of people came to CIMB uh, as the investment bank that actually understands Asia. Uh, so today we're looking at many uh, investment opportunities uh, for Australians uh, into ASEAN, uh, mainly Indonesia uh, and Malaysia. Uh, so that's how we play it. I think um, UBS, uh, the RBS acquisition is a little bit advanced in the sense that um, the intra-Asian flows uh, haven't really picked up. Uh, but it's chicken and egg, right? If we wait and sit back and let the Western banks uh, dictate the way uh, capital flows uh, within Asia, uh, then A, they will make the money. And B, they may not represent uh, Asia and Asian opportunities uh, well. Yeah, so it is imperative, I always say that, for this to be truly an Asian century, it's important that Asians rise to the challenge and we create the financial intermediaries uh, and so on in order to uh, profit and really make that Asian century a reality. Yeah. That's, what we're, that's what we're trying to do. But that doesn't detract from the fundamental that as a business, we will always be seen as ASEAN. Um, can, can we just dive into that a little bit? You said something about sort of you draw this distinction between sort of the current uh, norm, which is Western banks um, sort of uh, dominating the investment banking as well as uh, perhaps consumer banking space as well around around the globe. Um, in what ways? So let's focus on the investment banking side. In what and uh, what are the ways in which um, you know sort of value in a way is um, given uh, or taken by or so-called so Western banks? Uh, and what's, what are we as Asian banks, uh, what money are we leaving on the table here? I think if you look at the global financial system today, it was constructed by the West. Uh, it is still dominated by the West. Uh, and today, if you look at the uh, rating system, for instance, you know, it's all dominated by S&P and Moody's. S&P and Moody's dictate how we look at one another, particularly in banking. It defines how much capital I have to put against a loan I give to a Chinese company. And that's how the new uh, bank, uh, uh, capital system for banks work. So my question is, why are we dependent on S&P and Moody's? Are they able to assess our credits properly? Well, if you look at the history, it's pretty bad. Uh, because for the longest time, they said that Spain was a much better credit than China. Yeah, when China is actually uh, doing all the lending. Spain is doing all the borrowing. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, a clear example of Western bias in the system. Until today, we still haven't evolved an Asian rating agency, which I keep saying to, uh, to, to RAM, they should evolve from RAM to RA, right? A rating agency Asia. Um, and 
Uh, if you look at banking uh, today, uh, still very much dominated uh, by the global players, but you see a discernible rise in uh, uh, Asian players. Yeah, and I think that is the trend uh, over uh, the next few years. You will, st you will see a strengthening of regional players, particularly uh, the Asian players. The, the Japanese are moving once again, the Chinese are moving, uh, and of course the ASEAN banks uh, are also moving. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's, I don't think what you're saying you're anti-Western banks. You're just saying that you are, you want Asian, uh, there's an opportunity for Asian banks to sort of, you know, um, do more intraflow funding within ASEAN, or within ASEAN or within Asia. Th that's what you're saying, right? You're not you know, being sort of, yeah, and, uh, sort of anti, uh, anti-Western banks. And I'm not anti anything. Um, okay, let's go dive into ASEAN itself. Um, ASEAN, there are challenges. I think um, you know uh, the the, the um, you, for example, I think you know uh, as you say uh, the Bank Niaga in Indonesia um, in 2002, and then you know at the time you know they could take a 97% stake, and it was actually very welcome because that was post Asian financial crisis. Um, but banks needed rec recapitalization and Bank of Commerce stepped in. Um, then the regulatory uh, frameworks changed. Things got better in Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia is now booming. And then the tune changed. Now, there was something that came out last year that said something along the lines of, you know, banks can only own 40%, foreign banks uh, can only own 40% of, um, you know, um, lo um, uh, Indonesian banks. How do you deal with that sort of unregulatory uh, uncertainty, flip-flops even? Well, people say, from, people from, say Malaysia also flip-flops. That's right, yeah. exactly. Yes. And I think that's a lesson for, that, that's a lesson for our regulators every as well. Every country has flip-flopping. Yeah. Uh, and I think you have to, you know, you take the good with the bad. Lah, you know. What's the good uh, here? And Indonesia is high growth, high margin, uh, place to do business, and we love it there. Yeah. Uh, but we live with, you know, uh, changes in regulation, uh, and we cope with it. My, my specific beef uh, with the change was, of course, that uh, if I tell you a little bit of the history, in 2002, uh, we spent, we had spent three years stalking Bang Niaga then. In 2002, uh, we became, you know, when we bought Bang Niaga, we were the first foreigner to buy a bank from Ibra, you know, their version of Danaharta. At that time, you know, they told me, they said, look, you know, please put a good bid in. This is very competitive. Uh, so I put, uh, we put a good price on the table and they said, and then I was so happy because they called me out and goes, you know, congratulations, you're on the short list. So I said, oh great, thank you. Who else is on the short list? Nobody, you're alone. <laughs> Nobody wanted to go into Indonesia. Indonesia was going to be a failed state. Our, when we announced it, our share price came down 25% within a week. You know, we bought the bank at 1.48 times book. You know, there was a yellow bank that bought a bank in Indonesia at four times book recently. Yeah, uh, so you can see timing is everything. Yeah. Timing is, is, is important, yeah. Uh, and, but then a few years on, when everything is hunky-dory, you know, suddenly uh, they, change, they want to change the rules and force us to sell. You know, so I kept telling them, I said, look, you know, but, you know, at that time, um, you know, we had this opportunity because foreign investment was needed. Uh, and it's not fair uh, now that everything is hunky-dory that we're told to sell out. Um, so the, but the thing is, you must, the way to approach this is you must understand the local dynamics. Uh, and you have to know that you're a foreigner uh, and don't, don't face it head on. Just, just do it privately uh, and um, appeal to rationality. Uh, and I think that's what happened. I remember on the day this new ruling was proposed, I had a whole bunch of foreign banks calling, CEOs calling me saying, hey, let's get together and do a public uh, appeal against this. I said, if you do that, there's the surest way of making sure these rules come in, right? Uh, Indonesia and other countries also, uh, you have to recognize that as a foreigner, you have to, you know, you have to do it quietly uh, and, 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 and understand that the local politics have to uh, play out. I think my view is that Indonesia, in a way, is a bit extreme because uh, democracy is, is new. Um, so things are still haven't quite settled. So there's no proper filter of what gets out in the public domain. Uh, so you get some of these very extreme views, uh, extreme ideas that actually f get float around in the public domain and nobody wants to kill it. 
because of just the, the evolution of the democratic system there. So you, you have to live with it. Um, in Philippines, uh, you had a little bit of a setback as well. Um, I think the aborted the purchase of Bank of Commerce there from, from San Miguel. Um, I mean, so th th there is one, I guess, successful, and then you have a regulatory flip-flop kind of situation, but another one you have a kind of like a situation where the whole, uh, the whole uh, transaction was aborted. What was, you know, um, what was behind that, um, that, you know? No, it's simple that, you know, some deals um, close, some deals don't close. Um, and in this case, um, we just had, couldn't quite agree uh, with the s vendor uh, on the final terms uh, of the transaction. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, we are committed to um, going to the Philippines uh, and are still looking at opportunities uh, for the Philippines. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, again, it's, an in, you know, it's a key market in ASEAN, uh, is integral to uh, what we're doing. Thailand, um, how's that coming along? That's going very well. Um, I think the Thai situation, again, you know, uh, this gives you a sense of the, the, the different uh, demands of doing business in different markets. In Thailand, basically the rules are such that for us to buy a controlling stake, uh, we, we had to buy a dysfunctional bank. Yeah. So that was the rule. You know. um, so um, we bought uh, Bang Thai then, uh, at a decent uh, price uh, from the government, and were able to buy uh, 90 over percent. Yeah. Whereas, you know, today, you know, for foreigners to go in, you can't buy control. Um, so, with that, it meant that we had. Uh, uh, it was always going to be a challenge to transform uh, the bank. There was a lot of work, uh, and it was going to take a number of years. Uh, what I would say today is that uh, we've done very well on the wholesale side, which is investment banking, uh, corporate lending, uh, treasury. Um, but it's still taking us time to fix uh, the retail side, uh, which is because it was a very, very, it, it was an operations that was a uh, very weak state. Uh, so there's a lot of systems work and so on and so forth to do. So if you had any advice amongst the business folks, um, the entrepreneurs, as well as the uh, corporate guys uh, amongst us this, evening, this afternoon and uh, this morning, um, in terms of doing business in ASEAN, um, what are the kind of things that you know you would you would advise them in terms of uh, you know, how to do it successfully? Have CIMB as your advisor, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, firstly, you know, let me say this: that the vision of ASEAN economic community is a beautiful vision, right? The concept that we would go as far as possible to create one economic community of 600 over million people yeah. uh, is a beautiful vision. I 100% subscribe to that vision. Uh, and that vision then, if you take one step further, has come with very specific uh, targets of single production base, um, free flow of uh, uh, goods and services, investment, skilled labor, um, uh, by 2015. Right. Um, so that's when it gets a little bit challenging because uh, the reality is I'm not sure uh, whether we will get to uh, that promised land by 2015. I think it will take uh, longer. Uh, and what I've publicly said is I appeal uh, to all the governments uh, to tell us the truth in terms of what's actually going to happen at the end of 2015 so that we can prepare. Right. If you tell us that this will happen by 2015, this will happen by 2018, that's fine. Uh, what I worry about, uh, about is we all prepare for 2015 and we don't quite get there. Uh, and then, you know, uh, uh, we will get into trouble and everyone will um, get disappointed and so on and so forth. That, that's the reality. Um, but whatever it is, then, we say that, yes, ASEAN uh, will be one someday, maybe not 2015. Right. Uh, and because it makes sense. Uh, then it's about businesses all having to prepare for that eventuality. You know, I keep telling, particularly the SMEs, I, I use this, this phrase, which is, ask not only what ASEAN can do for you, ask also what ASEAN can do to you. Yeah? Uh, because if you're not prepared for ASEAN, you can get into deep trouble. Yeah? Then, in terms of preparing for ASEAN, uh, what I said earlier, every country is different. Uh, you have 
to go there and understand the country, its rules, its people, its language, uh, and uh, to do business. Yeah, and different, and therefore each country also requires different strategies. Even managing uh, people in different countries uh, require uh, different approaches. You know, you have to understand the nuances and be careful. You know, I've had some very uh, interesting uh, episodes here. You know, in say in Indonesia, for instance, it is true. You know, when you ask, when the when you give an instruction to your staff in Indonesia and they say yes. It actually just means, yes, they hear you, not, yes, they can do it, they're going to do it. Yeah? So you've got to follow up. Different things uh, mean different things, uh, dif uh, different to different people. Um, when I was in, uh, and language nuances, when I was in uh, Bangkok, when I first arrived at my new operation, CIMB Thai, I said to, I had a meeting with the government, then I had to get to the airport. So I told them, I said, look, this is impossible because of your traffic jam. I need an outrider to get to the airport. They said, yes, sir, don't worry, we'll sort it out. So uh, I said, okay, went for a meeting, came back, and I said, is my outrider here? He said, yes. He gave me a helmet and a motorbike. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then in, in Philippines, you know, I was rushing for the airport again. It's always my life, rushing to the airport. And there was a traffic jam to the airport. The airport was 10 minutes away from my hotel, but the, 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 it, just, it was a car park. So I told my driver, I said, look, I really need to get this flight. I have a meeting, I have to get this flight. Then he said, sir, if you really want it, we do counter traffic. And I just didn't understand what he meant. I said, whatever, just get me there. So he went to the other side of the road, <laughs> full throttle uh, to the airport. And I tell you, I died a thousand times uh, on that journey. Yeah. Uh, so be careful. Eh? Uh, don't just say yes, uh, think about what they're actually telling you. Yeah. Uh, so different uh, strategies uh, in different markets and some markets you really need partners. Uh, Philippines, given where I read the environment today, uh, I want a partner, I want a good partner. Uh, and that's part of the reason why um, uh, we, uh, our partner, we couldn't agree on the proper partnership arrangement with San Miguel, that's why uh, we didn't proceed with the deal. Um, and then in terms of uh, management, uh, you've got to get the right people on the ground uh, I really think that ASEAN is so diverse uh, that it's dangerous uh, for you to go on this expansion and then just parachute Malaysians in each country, right? I think you really need to embrace uh, uh, local teams uh, to do the management and make them feel that when they, are, they work for you, they're really part of your management team. My monthly management meeting now, you know, uh, uh, the, the real group management team is multi ASEAN, you know, my CEO of Indonesia, uh, CEO of Thailand, CEO of Singapore, we all meet uh, round table and they feel that they're running the company uh, as a whole. So the, the Indonesian CEO also challenges the Singapore CEO about his business. And one day, when I look at succession, um, the Indonesia CEO or the Singapore CEO may take over as group CEO because that's, that's CIMB being uh, a truly uh, ASEAN uh, company. So uh, embracing uh, the, 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 the local management. And this is where, let me just uh, wrap up by saying this, that we are so lucky um, to be a Malaysian in that context. If you actually look at successful companies uh, in the region, actually Malaysia has far more than its fair share. Why? I truly believe it's because how we all grew up. We are so comfortable being multiracial here, multicultural here, that when we deal uh, with uh, 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 other uh, ASEAN people, uh, we actually just handle it much, much better uh, than the more homogeneous uh, nations of ASEAN. So our diversity, our di diverse upbringings is something to be proud of. And I think you applause for that, for that comment. Um, you, did I just hone in a little bit on that, you know, when you say, you know, parachuting managers from Malaysia, uh, notwithstanding our diverse backgrounds, that is, that, you know, that could be a, a, a risk. Um, what, are there any shortcomings that you see amongst uh, Malaysian managers as we venture overseas, as we put into overseas um, um, organizations, um, and even ASEAN organizations? Are there shortfalls that you would like to see, kind of like, you know, in a way, somehow you kind of like put a wish out there to see how, how, where they can be addressed? Well, I think it's very difficult to generalize Malaysians, like, because Malaysians are so diverse anyway, by definition. But I think uh, we all must remember that 
you know, many, many of us work in very successful companies in Malaysia. You know, many of our companies are successful, then we go out. So almost by definition, we're successful in Malaysia. So then our people get very comfortable with the fact that they are in the successful operations. Uh, so then they get very reluctant uh, to then have to, be, to move to a different country uh, and then having almost to prove themselves again. So Malaysians must be bolder in taking on uh, that uh, challenge of working in, in, in working overseas, uh, if you like. Um, but interestingly, uh, some of my senior guys that I've actually sent in to Indonesia, I'm now having difficulty in bringing them back. Uh, uh, so, you know, once they, they, they get comfortable, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's fun, it's challenging, it's exciting. Uh, and, you know, I just met one of my guys yesterday, I was so proud of him, you know, we transferred him to Thailand. And the guy reads, uh, and uh, even reads Thai today, you know, in a space of uh, 18 months. Uh, and that's fantastic. He's got a Thai girlfriend, obviously, but... <laughs> um, there's the other thing about... I get, I get, there's the other thing about culture, as you're managing the different organizations. As you say, you, you know, um, you know uh, how people treat... Um, uh, how people respond to communication is um, it's just different in different countries. Um, how two, on, on two dimensions, I wanted to ask. One is, I think we've covered a little bit about the, the ASEAN uh, countrywide culture. But what we haven't covered is a little bit about the sort of um, retail banking, corporate banking, and investment banking culture. These are three very different animals. And I know that, you know, you've, you know being a universal, a universal bank of sorts, you are sort of having to contend with, you know, the sort of swashbuckling, so-called, I mean, that's what we think, uh, investment banking culture versus a safe, uh, safe corporate banking culture. How, how, how do you straddle those kind of three uh, different um, cultures? No, it is, it is, it is tough. Uh, it's about, you know, I always tell my guys, you know, the success of the organization is about our ability to manage uh, traders and tellers. You know, uh, the ability to um, be equally focused paying someone a few million bucks and paying someone a few thousand bucks for what they do. You know, because to them, it's just as important. Yeah, so you must stay engaged uh, with people as opposed to the dollars and cents. Yeah, I think that, that, that's very, very important. Uh, and a person uh, in my retail bank um, is equally important to me as my investment banker who on a single deal uh, makes me truck loads of money, right? Uh, I think that that's the, the, the way that you have to manage such a diverse uh, range of businesses. Uh, but I fundamentally believe that the universal bank model is the right and imperative uh, model uh, for our survival in the long term. So it's a challenge that we have to take on. Okay. All right. there's, there's some stats here that says you know, like your, um, your cost to income ratio, um, you, know, sort of you had a target of about 50%. Um, and, and actually, it's, it, it's ended up somewhere around 59, 59%. Um, is this, um, what is driving that? Is that these investment bankers that are, you know, the, that, that they're doing great deals for you, that they get, gets you those high cost income ratios? Is it the RBS? Uh, no, no, program? it's, the target is 50 by 15. Yeah. So uh, it's a two year, two year thing. And, you know, our cost structures uh, are still... Um, are you happy with the cost structure at the moment? It's still impaired by the legacy uh, of the organizations and I keep... Which are those legacies? One legacy is actually a regional model. Um, the problem with, you know, say if I were to merge with another bank in... Say, say if I were to merge with Maybank tomorrow. Okay, that's not going to go on the news, all right? <laughs> this is just theory. <laughs> just a hypothetic, um, hypothetical then, situation. In that case, you basically can integrate the operations. You have one CFO, you want one CRO, etc. But if you then do a regional model, and ours has large regional components, then Indonesia still has, there's only limited amount of integration that you can do. You still need an Indonesia CFO, you still need an Indonesian CRO, uh, you still need onshore operations, etc. Et so if you compare like for like, uh, a bank with a large uh, international operations uh, will, at least at the beginning, have this duplicative cost until the revenue synergies outweigh uh, those duplicative costs. Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, um, we come from 
some of our uh, transformation work is still in progress. And today we're spending 1.1 billion uh, on a single IT system right across uh, the region. Uh, so this kind of uh, investment uh, will bring uh, costs at the beginning. So it's about uh, uh, evolving uh, into um, uh, a, 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 a more uh, comparable uh, CI ratio over time. Um, and how about RBS? Um, the employees of RBS, at one point in time, there was um, speculation that you know, the, um, the, the number of people, I mean, the people that you retain of RBS uh, has not been very high. I mean, about 50% number was bandied about. Is that, um, is, is, uh, has, have, have you been able to retain the people? Did you want to retain them? Uh, was it I mean, it's, it's a very s relatively small acquisition. You know, people, some people, someone, compared it to Nomura and Lehman Brothers. Let me remind you that Lehman Brothers post-merger uh, made up 42% of the staff of Nomura. Yeah, RBS makes up less than 1% of the CIMB uh, staff strength. Uh, we only, the operation was 600 people, we bought 300. Uh, that means we, we, we picked 300 people. Uh, and then, you know, we had to bring them on, stabilize the operations, evaluate the people that we bring on. Uh, so we've actually let some go. Uh, the ones that we don't think are right, we've actually hired others. Yeah, and it's really fully integrated into uh, uh, CIMB uh, already. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, I feel pretty good uh, about um, the impact uh, it's having on the overall uh, IB franchise. Um, before I bring Datuk Sri Jijala on, can I just ask you one question, which perhaps is a good prelude to uh, uh, Datuk Sri Jijala coming, up, coming on, on, on stage. Um, your views on the budget. Um, I think you were, you know, it's, uh, reports came out, I saw your press release about being, um, uh, uh, you like the, um, you like the sort of, uh, the, the stance of uh, being fiscally responsible. Um, do, you, do, you like, do you like the tone of the budget overall? Do you like the substance of the budget overall? Yeah, we at CIMB were very pleased with the budget. My economist was ecstatic with the budget, which actually means that it's probably an unpopular budget. <laughs> I mean, he was, you know, so happy with RPGT, GST, and all that. So I said, look, you know, uh, this is the first time I've seen you so pleased with the budget, so I'm worried. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think that the, the, so my position on the budget is it was the absolutely the right budget to have at this point in time. Yeah, and uh, I think, you know, we said it was courageous, it was, it was responsible uh, in a sense that if you look at the expenditure uh, increase, uh, it, uh, less than the revenue increase, um, we are set to, to meet the 3.5% uh, target by the end of uh, 2014. Uh, and, you know, we've put uh, 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 the, the long-term instruments in place uh, for us to manage the government finances uh, better. Uh, but let me also uh, highlight that in my comment uh, in the budget, I also pointed out uh, that the, the debt level is 54.8%, uh, I think, by end 2014 forecast. That doesn't give much headroom. Yeah, uh, because financial market, the, the, the global conditions can be surprised, can surprise you. Uh, so the government doesn't have that much room to manoeuvre. Um, so not even through off-balance sheet items? I mean, off, sorry? Not even through off-budget items? I mean, off-budget <laughs> items, collateral obligations? In tough times, off-budget becomes on-budget. Yeah. yeah, that's my worry. Yeah. And that yeah. off-budget right uh, now is about 68% so if you include that. Yeah, yeah. so, so that's, you have to be careful. Yeah, so... I would urge, I'm urging the government to really focus on uh, spend management. Yeah, uh, and you know, we, I, you know, we said that two, three years ago that really you know, spend management is important because it's, you need to spend, but you need to manage how you spend. Yeah, and this is, you know, we've seen this over many, many years that, you know, the government hasn't quite, you know, managed their spending well. Yeah, uh, and it's good that they've set up the fiscal committee and so on. And clearly. The government is aware of it, yeah. But being aware and actually being able to fix it are two different things. Yeah. So we look. We should really look carefully uh, at how the government uh, uh, does its spend uh, going forward. Okay.